Being a literature student, I read a lot of books. Most of these books are your classics. Shakespeare, Leo Tolstoy, you name it, we have read it. But the beauty of being a literature student is that you get to read a lot of stuff. Sometimes, these books, stories, or articles that we read are very out of the ordinary. Once our professor asked us to research and read about the origins of fairy tales and the true stories behind them, and I have observed that most of the fairy tales we tell kids these days have come out of some kind of twisted stories. So today, I have decided to share one of them with you. Now, I would start by saying most of us have heard the story of Peter Pan, right? In the story, Peter Pan is a boy who is eternally a child and has a bunch of friends who like him as well as forever kids. This boy has magical abilities and with the help of these abilities, he takes a little girl named Wendy to a place called Neverland. Also, there is a small fairy called Tinkerbell who always accompanies Peter Pan. When Wendy grows up, Peter stops visiting her. However, there is a pirate captain called Captain Hook who is always trying to catch Peter but is never successful. Well, the premise of the story sounds very lighthearted and appropriate for kids. The real story behind this magical fairy tale is very, very different and dark. The story I'm about to tell is not for the lighthearted. So, if you do not want to ruin a good fairy tale for yourself, you may stop now. But, if you are interested in dark cartoon conspiracy theory, keep watching. A long time ago, there was a small town near the sea. In this town, there were plenty of kids. These kids had the most amazing childhood growing up in such a beautiful town. They used to play on the beach and enjoy their lives very much. However, once in a while, a kid or two used to go missing. The parents of these kids were very protective of their children, as no one was ever able to find out who took the kids and where. Therefore, once the kids were of a certain age, all parents used to keep an eye on them all the time. But on the bright side, the missing kids always returned. They used to come back to their little coastal town of theirs, but these returned children were different. They were stripped of their previous enthusiasm, their childhood, and their passion for life. It was as if the returned kids had the attitude and behavior of an adult human beaten down by life. But in this town was a little girl, Wendy, who lived with her parents and had a room that faced the sea. Every night she slept while looking at the sea waves sparkling under the moonlight. But occasionally, she saw a few kids go across the sea in a boat. The kids looked happy and probably were having a lot of fun. Wendy, too, wished to go on that boat someday. A few days passed and finally, the day came when her wish would be fulfilled. While she was playing one evening, she was approached by a new kid she had never seen before. This kid was oddly dressed, but very friendly. So she got to know him, and his name was Peter. Peter asked Wendy whether she would like to join him and his friends on a trip to Neverland, a magical trip to the other side of the sea. And because she had seen many kids make this trip, she immediately said yes. As instructed by Peter, Wendy snuck out of her bedroom once everyone was asleep and waited for him at the seashore. A boat came from the ocean and Peter was on it. Along with him were a few other kids. These kids, just like Peter, were a little weirdly dressed. But little Wendy didn't mind. She loved that they were so friendly and were overjoyed that she was joining them on a trip to Neverland. Once they were far away from the ocean and steadily moving towards Neverland, Wendy, along with her newfound friends, and Peter, of course, was singing songs. But things quickly changed when their boat reached Neverland. The town was in a panic. Another kid had disappeared and most likely would return with their souls sucked out of them. Wendy's parents had never in a million years imagined that the next target could be their lovely girl, Wendy. They tried all they could, but there was no clue of their little girl. The kids who had been missing before were of no help either. That's when a pirate steps in. He is a long, pointy Mustang, wears a hat, and has a hook for a hand. 
He says that he knows who abducts the kids, and he's been at sea trying to catch the culprit for years. Wendy's parents and other folks were relieved to find at least one person who knew something about the missing kids. Captain Hook further told the town that he almost caught the culprit, but due to an unfortunate altercation, the culprit got away and Hook lost his hand. However, this time, he is prepared to catch the guy and bring Wendy back home, safe and sound. Nevertheless, days pass, and Captain Hook is back at sea with his crew, looking for the culprit, Peter. But to no avail, he isn't able to catch Peter or find Neverland. A couple of days later, Wendy's mother goes up to her empty room to find Wendy laying on the bed. She is curled up and had no expression on her face, even though she is wide awake. Her parents are overjoyed to have her back, but it's obvious that just like the other kids, she too has changed. She has retracted deep into her shell and lost all the light in her eyes. She seems physically okay, but it's clear something has scarred her emotionally. The news of Wendy's return reaches Captain Hook, and he immediately comes back to the little town with his crew. But on his return, he finds out that she too had become a shell of the person she used to be. But after seeing the deep concern in the eyes of Wendy's parents, Hook decides to tell them the truth. And the truth is more terrifying than you think. So, when Hook was a little boy, and just like Wendy, lived in this very town with his parents, he was once approached by a kid. This kid dressed weirdly, but was very friendly. Then he invited Hook to a fairyland. Hook, being a naive young boy, was desperate to go to the fairyland with his new friend Peter. They got on a boat at night, and in the morning reached Neverland. However, little Hook did not find any magic in Neverland. Instead, he experienced darkness like no other. When he returned, he too isolated himself, didn't talk, and didn't eat much. But as Hook grew older, he understood what had happened to him, and he decided to take a stand and stop Peter. To do so, he found fellow men who had experienced the same horrors as him and wanted justice. They all decided to be pirates under the leadership of Hook. They began their quest to find Peter and avenge themselves. Only Peter would never be in their grasp. He was always one step ahead of them. He was faster, quicker, and smarter. Now, you must ask what was so terrible that had happened to all the missing kids. You see, Neverland was never a fairyland. It was a small island in the sea where little kids like Wendy were preyed upon. These kids were brought there by a dwarf man called Peter, who looked like a child but was a grown person, and his team of dwarves who pretended to be kids. On this island, little kids were assaulted in many different ways, breaking not only their body, but their souls too. And you may wonder then, what about Tinkerbell? Well, there was no Tinkerbell. It was a figment of Peter's twisted imagination. This twisted story was spun into a kid's fairy tale and is told throughout the ages to kids as a bedtime story. Hello, my name is Earl. I'll tell you the truth. I hate horror. I never liked it, and I probably never will. But if I'm here telling you this story, it's because no matter how hard you try to live through a terrifying situation, if you're destined to live through it, you can't escape it. It all started a few years ago. I must admit that I was a very restrictive parent. My son was only 12 years old, and since his mother was permissive, I was the parent who set the limits. And, to be honest, horror movies were my limit. I knew that sooner or later I was going to see horror movies, but when I was still a kid, I'd rather not. Something about them always struck me as too violent, 
and while some might say I was too extreme, it was my choice. The first of our tragedies began on Wednesday morning. At the time, I didn't know what happened, so imagine my surprise when, waking up to the intense heat, smoke, and horrible smell in the house, I woke up only to see my house on fire. My wife woke up almost at the same time, and we both rushed to rescue our son, but to our surprise, he was already out of the house. At that moment, it seemed strange to us. Josh was someone who was a very heavy sleeper. Besides, he was quite fearful. He would never come out of his room if he saw a fire. Anyway, we decided not to think about it. We were just glad he was safe, so we went to a hotel. Inside the hotel, we began to notice that Josh was behaving very strangely. He was drawing weird pictures, like strange symbols and horrible death scenes. To make it worse, he didn't sleep much at night, and we rarely saw him playing. He would just watch TV, even when it was turned off. I asked Josh if he was watching horror movies or series, or anything that would have a bad influence on him, but no, he just said he was watching SpongeBob SquarePants. Just in case, I temporarily forbade him from watching any cartoon other than SpongeBob, since we both watched it together and I knew it was harmless. We thought everything was going to be better, but the passage of time in that scary, cheap hotel we paid for while waiting for insurance only brought more problems. Josh was getting weirder and weirder. He barely spoke to us, and his behavior became more and more erratic. It got to the point where he didn't even seem like our son anymore. Just a very strange person who could only watch TV, whether it was on or not. Both my wife and I thought it was probably stress. At the end of the day, Josh was just a 12-year-old boy who had just survived a huge house fire. He sure didn't like being in this hotel either. This place was pretty big, but as I told you before, it was in terrible condition and it gave us a bad vibe. It felt like a place that would only be in a horror movie. It all came to a head when, instead of seeing their strange behavior as usual, Something worse happened. Something worse was happening. Josh would now cry for no reason all day long, and nothing we said seemed to calm him down except seeing SpongeBob in the hotel. We tried taking him for walks and taking him to a psychologist, but it seemed to make his strange behavior worse. We convinced ourselves this was just a phase, Nothing could prepare us for what we were going through, and nothing could prepare us for what we were going through next. That day, Josh was particularly quiet. There was even something different about his face. He looked like he was determined to do something. Was it to get better? I went to greet him in the evening, but something caught my attention. He was not lying in his bed but was with a bottle of alcohol that he took from my bathroom overturned on the floor. Meanwhile, he had a match in his hand. Josh was ready to light the place up. I tried to get the matches out of his hand, but his threat was becoming more and more real with every step he took. At that point, he confessed to us that he was the one who set the house on fire because he wanted to kill us. He said he wanted to do it because he loved us, but that life was just a meaningless waste of time. Those were not Josh's words. Who had told him these things? Determined to end our lives and destroy the hotel, he lit a match that fell into the alcohol. But in the middle of the fall, it went out. I ran to my son and took away the matches. The boy panicked at the impossibility of lighting the place on fire. In response, he just said one thing that I wasn't ready to hear. He said, I had to do it. 
Otherwise, the people inside the TV will come after me. When I asked him what he meant, something happened that surprised me a lot. His TV turned on by itself while they were watching an episode with SpongeBob. Or at least that's what I thought it was. When I watched the program just for a few minutes, I noticed that there was something wrong. That was not the SpongeBob channel. It didn't even look like the original at all. As I continued watching, I saw something even weirder. Their characters were crying blood, had big dark circles under their eyes, and had scary faces. I turned off the TV immediately, but it turned itself back on. There was something weird going on here. Suddenly, the hotel was filled with a strange and dense energy that only generated more. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew we had to leave now. Something very bad was happening here, but I didn't know what. From one second to the next, Josh started crying blood, just like the characters on the show that looked like SpongeBob SquarePants. My wife and I grabbed him unawares, noticing that there was a strange smell. The hotel, it was on fire, too. The fire had started in our room, but no one was in it. Before we knew it, our son ran into the flames and started to burn, but my wife and I saved him in time, and his injuries were only minor burns. We all escaped from that scary hotel and went to a better one. Josh was still distracted, but I could tell he was doing much better. I found out about this strange SpongeBob SquarePants-like series. That show was called Creepy Pasta, and everyone on the internet thought it was just a made-up story, something to entertain the kids. I also read that it doesn't appear on any particular channel. It just appears randomly on some distorted channel or when the TV was turned off. It is also said that this cursed TV show gets into your head, talking to you in your mind and entering your dreams. After we moved to a new hotel, I banned Josh from watching any kind of show, and over time, his behavior returned to normal. The only thing is that this story doesn't even have a happy ending, since during the last few years, I continue to be stuck. Every night that I am sleeping, I dream of that horrendous hotel. I dream that I'm passing by the dining room and the TV suddenly turns on. Unable to move, I watch as the cursed characters from the SpongeBob show slowly come out of the TV. As if knowing I can't move, they grab my whole body and slowly pull me into the TV. When I wake up, I can only cry, and to my wife's comfort, I hear voices in my head, voices that try to camouflage themselves with my thoughts, and that tells me that I should set my family on fire. I won't lie to you, heeding the voices becoming more and more tempting, but just as I tried therapy or yoga and failed, I will find a way to finally get those voices out of my head and never watch anything related to SpongeBob SquarePants again. Being a social worker means I get to work with people from all facets of life. Be it homeless, the sick, the poor, sometimes even kids, or the rich and elite who fund my no profit to save taxes. For the past 20 years, I have been running my own nonprofit organization that helps the needy to live a better life. However, for the past four years, my organization also helps to save and rehabilitate trafficked kids and women. It's truly disturbing how cruel people can be towards others of their own kind. Every year since, hundreds of kids and women come and stay in my organization. Some for a long time, while others till their families or guardians came to get them. Last week, a little boy named Marcus arrived at my organization. 
As a protocol, each person who arrives at my NGO for any kind of help is required to fill out some documentation and go through a medical examination to determine if they are healthy. As many of the kids are still very young, like Marcus, our staff fill these forms on their behalf. When Marcus arrived along with a couple of other kids, I knew that the children were saved by the cops from a trafficking ring. They had been kidnapped from their homes, school, playgrounds, grocery stores, etc., and were trafficked. It's sad, but the stats say that every year, more and more women and kids are sold into the flesh trade worldwide. And helping these kids and women to get back on their feet and return to their life is what we do at my NGO. Marcus was one of them, and although all the kids were pretty scared and shaken from the trauma they experienced, Marcus seems weirdly immune to it all. When it was his turn to answer my questions to fill out the form, I got to learn a lot about this kid. Hey, buddy, you're next. Would you mind coming in with me? I went to the lobby outside of my office and called Marcus inside for his documentation. Without even looking at me, he followed me inside. He sure wasn't older than five, so I had to help him sit on the chair. Is your name Marcus? I asked. Without lifting his head, he just nodded his reply. How old are you, Marcus? I asked again, even though deep down, I knew he would be around seven or eight. Five, he said. I was a little shocked because he was too little to be five. What is your surname, buddy? This time he looked at me and I saw a sad, haunting expression on his face. Marcus Miller, he said. From the way he spoke, it seemed that he was seven, even though his size said otherwise. Hey, Marcus, would you mind telling me more about your parents and family? I always try a friendly approach and ask kids about their families in a very casual manner. Most of the kids who had happy families before being trafficked started talking about them. But Marcus just stared at me with his big, hazed eyes. Marcus, please tell me about your mom and dad. This time, I was gentler with the boy because I sensed something was off. My dad sold me to a bad man for money, and my mom drinks too much. So, she is always lost in her own world. The boy replied in a timid and sad voice. I was shocked to know that this boy was sold to the traffickers by his own father for some cash. But before I could reply or react, Marcus continued. My dad took me out of school when I was in the first grade because we couldn't afford it. My mom is a stay-at-home mom and is drunk all the time. My dad does some work occasionally because we don't have much money. I felt like my heart was ripped out of my chest after listening to his words. Where do your parents live, Marcus? Something snapped inside him and his dull and sad demure changed to panic in an instant. Please, please don't look for them. Please, please, I don't want to go back home. That was a shocking thing to hear again, because all of these rescued kids always wanted to go back to their mommy and daddy. Do you not want to go back home? No. He frantically shook his head. Did something happen? You can tell me. It's safe here. My dad hit me and so did my mom. They never loved me. They always fought about money and cursed at me. They do not want me or love me. Can I stay here, please? It was a tough call to make, but I decided not to look for his parents and let him stay here. The good part, he wasn't physically harmed and was a healthy kid. A little small for his age, but I was sure he would grow with some love and care. But I still decided to keep an eye on him, to make sure he was okay and didn't show any signs of any kind of trauma. Turns out, Marcus loved to draw most of the time, unlike other kids who loved to play and watch TV. Marcus just sat in a corner and drew. On one such evening, I sat beside him to see how he was doing. What are you drawing, Marcus? He looked at me and passed me his drawing sheet. On that sheet was a drawing of a woman, Marcus had drawn the face of the woman and her body. The woman was very disfigured, but I ignored it because most of the kids' drawings are weird and disfigured. But instead of using colors, he had drawn the woman in all black. 
Why don't you use any other colors? I asked him. And who is this woman? He looked at me with those big eyes for a while. She is the one that took me. Took you? For a second, I didn't know what he meant. But then I understood who the woman was. It was the one who bought him from his father. She used to watch me, he further added. I had no idea what to say or do. So instead, I decided to check out his other drawings, and sure enough, all his other drawings were of the same woman drawn in black. It was so disturbing holding his sketches in hand and not knowing what to do. So I decided to dig in a bit more. Do you know where this woman is now? No, he said. But she still watches me. What? Marcus just pointed towards the open window. And I saw a shadow of a woman walking away. I ran towards the window and peeked out, but there was no one there. I looked back at Marcus and he was still drawing the same woman. Now with the drawing of that woman in my hand and the knowledge that the child traffickers are keeping an eye on my NGO and all the kids I save, I feel very scared and worried for the safety of these kids. I feel so confused and lost that I don't know what I should do. Call the cops to warn the authorities or was the shadow of the woman a figment of my imagination?